Um, I can use my own commodity voice. So. Anyway, thank you for thank you for coming. We thought we'd start a few minutes earlier, so um, we would have some more time for the question and answers for the board, or get out of here, or enjoy the nice weather. So we really appreciate it. Thank you for coming, and welcome to Hunger Mountains Co-op's dinner and discussion. This is the uh, second or third year that we're doing this. Um, my name is Scott Hess. I'm the uh, co-op president this year, and it's become an, uh, an annual event, and we really appreciate you all coming out. And we've got a great panel here for, uh, for some discussion and, and, and learning about uh, our, our food world. Um, this year, we'll, the co-op's been focusing on uh, local foods, core value um, for our co-op, because as we, you may have heard, we've been promoting um, and extremely proud of 40% of the products that your co-op sells um, is local from Vermont, and, uh, and that's one of the highest in the country. So we're really proud of that, and we shall, it's, it's because of you. It's, it's the products that you all um, uh, purchase. We, I'd just like to thank Jana Clark for uh, providing us with this space for uh, the second or third year in a row. It's, um, it's been great working with her. Uh, you probably know about the exit, the emergency exit there, the bathrooms when you first come in, um, that's where they are. So you can exit from each side, and I won't give you the, uh, the lost nation the way you came in. Um, and we want to thank the, the, the kitchen. Uh, Doug and his crew obviously do a wonderful job each year, and um, on a regular basis, on a daily basis. We've got a bunch of council members um, here today. I think uh, everyone's here except for two. Uh, Ashley Hill wasn't available to come, and uh, and we miss Jessica Knapp. She had a serious um, fall, and she's doing fine, but she's had some uh, a major uh, mobility problems. But she, I just heard from Robin that she's on her way to recovery. She's the uh, the staff rep, so we want to uh, we want to welcome her. And Katie Michaels is here. And if you guys just want to stand up, Steve Farnham, Eric Jacobson, they're all uh, kind of grouped over here. Eva Shackman, Eva's around, there's Eva. Um, who else? Mark Simikowski, Pat Sergey is here, and Shannon Leslie is right there. So we'll, you'll have an opportunity to ask any or all of us some uh, individual questions or group questions. We're, oh, I'm sorry, Katie Michaels. I forgot Katie, Can you're on the first on the list. Oh, you did. Did, I, did I miss anybody? Okay. That, I said I said I mentioned Shannon. She stood up. Call up council. Did I miss anybody? Okay. Anyway, all right. Thanks so much. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to our uh, our wonderful facilitator tonight, Jean Hamilton. She's a sustainable food system specialist who helps businesses develop and developing effective communications strategic planning network facilitation and innovation. And she's worked for Black River Produce and NOFA Vermont and contributes to the state, the state's farm to plate network. And she's also a fellow uh, board president of, uh, of Plainfield. So thank you so much for facilitating tonight and, and welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. So, oh. <laughs> Um, great, well thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really just here to make sure these guys all stay in line. Um, but I think it's going to be better for me if I stand over here. So, uh, I think we're going to start with some introductions. We've got three really great panelists who all are critical to our local food system here in Vermont. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So if you guys could just start with your name and who you're representing, what organization you're with, the role you play there and your favorite Vermont food. Mine is Butterworks Jersey Milk Yogurt. Hello, I'm uh, Jason Elberson, uh, owner of Sober Mesa Fermented Foods. Uh, we're in our fifth year in business, selling at uh, a number of farmer's markets, specifically Burlington, and uh, we make kimchis and sauerkrauts and all sorts of probiotic goodies. Um, we're based out of Marshfield, um, just down the road. Um, I might have to be biased and say <laughs> my favorite Vermont food is our wonderful line of kimchi products. Um, but uh, also, I think it's really just the uh, 
prevalence of really fresh, really amazing organic produce, which we use in our home kitchen table and in all of our products. So we, uh, we really value all the hard work that the organic Vermont farmers are doing. And I think they really just make the best food that other people then could turn into things. Is there somewhere they can taste your products? Yes, we have our tables set up right here. We have uh, three different kinds of uh, kimchi and kraut. Uh, please come up and try some. Ask me uh, any and all the questions you have about ferments and we can chat. Um, but they are available here for tasting. And I shall also mention they are on sale for just the rest of the month uh, at the co-op. All right. Um, hi everyone, my name is Olivia. I, um, I work for Hunger Mountain Co-op as the uh, lead grocery buyer. Um, so I do a lot of work with planning um, promotions and selecting new items, um, some of the category reviews and things like that. Um, and I work really closely with a lot of um, local vendors um, in, my, in the departments that I, I work with. Um, Planning those promotions and and you know Sobri Mesa was a really wonderful brand that we got to bring on this year and um, that's some of my favorite work to do so um, and then my favorite Vermont food uh, would probably have to be Fat Toad Farm caramel sauce um, they're out of Brookfield Vermont and um, they are a wonderful goat dairy farm um, who partners with other goat dairy farms in Vermont and. Uh, makes an incredible traditional um, caramel that I think is really great on brownies. So, <laughs> um, great. Yeah. All right, so um, I'm Jay Claro. I work at the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund as the Farm to Plate Director. Um, so what Farm to Plate is, is Vermont is pretty unique in that we have a legislatively enabled food system plan. Um, so I have the pleasure of um, helping to coordinate uh, the Farm to Plate Network, which is a group of over, uh, we estimate 300 plus organizations from um, nonprofits to business, farm and food businesses um, that are implementing that plan. And um, we also, we have a kind of evaluation role as well as uh, part of the, uh, so we annually report to the legislature on progress towards um, our, our plans, uh, goals, and um, so yeah, uh, my and my favorite Vermont food, so I, I felt like there was kind of two categories, so I love any uh, pasture, pasture-based um, meat product, I think um, is something to be proud about and is always delicious, and uh, cream top milk is something that I think is I, as I thought about it, I was like, it's so fundamental uh, and foundational. And um, so, yeah, those are my two. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Well, you all are going to have some time at the end to ask your own questions, but I just wanted to know if any of you wanted to share one of your favorite Vermont foods. Or actually, does anybody here like eating local food from Vermont? Anybody like show of hands? <laughs> is that something you're into? That is a surprisingly small number of hands. <laughs> but yeah, why don't you just shout out like a couple of things you um, are excited about in our food system here? Money. Woo! Yeah. Organic beans. Sustainable agriculture. Great. Organic beans from the old earth. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice one. Sweet potato. <laughs> yeah. Maple syrup. Thank you. <laughs> Well, um, I, I, I'm not from here, I'm from DC, but it has been such an extreme pleasure and one of the really primary reasons that I've made Vermont my home is this incredible agricultural landscape and the food we have access to. And I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of farms and food producers and our state government and nonprofits to try to build this food system and I know how inspiring it is and I also know how challenging it is. So I'm hoping you all can each take a, a little moment to Tell us something that you feel is going really well for you right now, and then also something that, um, that you see is particularly challenging in uh, this movement or this marketplace. Should we start with Jake? So that sure. <laughs> Mix oh, it up. Oh boy. It's hard for me to name just one, Jake. Um, <laughs> but also, I'll start with, yeah, so for some things that are working well, um, 
we've been doing uh, some more kind of focus, what we call like subsector um, uh, development. So uh, in, an example of that is recently we worked with a number of grass-fed beef producers uh, to improve their um, not only their production practices, but their overall business um, management. Um, sort of what we realized through some research was that, uh, you know, really grass-fed beef production in Vermont is a pretty nascent industry. You know, certainly there's been people doing it, but sort of in a serious um, and financially sustainable way, it's, um, there's, there's still a lot of progress to be made. Um, and so we, we've done some market research, but then we were able to bring uh, a program called Ranching for Profit, which th the name might kind of not resonate, um, and that's partially because this is a program that is typically run out in the West, um, and also in Canada, and it's, it's been run internationally as well. But um, So we were able to, uh, in working with some grass-fed beef producers here, identify that as a program um, that was um, desired by, by those producers to come to Vermont. And the program has never been in the Northeast, it's always been out west or in Canada. So we're able to bring um, what is ultimately is a school, so it's a week-long intensive school um, to the state of Vermont and opened it up actually to New England. Uh, we were able to have uh, 10 Vermont farms participate in this program and graduate. Um, really come out with um, a lot of insight as to how they can focus their energies on their business in a more profitable manner. Um, and what we did was we supplemented that by, and, and mind you too, this is a school that costs $2,700 to attend, so these producers had a lot of um, investment to, in, in the game to um, go through the school. And then we supplemented that by providing um, some implementation grants to them afterwards. So we're sort of in the process of, of providing that support to them for um, what has come to be a lot of, what's needed by a lot of our grassroots beef producers is um, more kind of portable scales um, and animal handling equipment just based on, you know, there's a lot, there's not a lot of contiguous um, land in Vermont for these producers, so they're moving a lot, around a lot and they don't always have the right type of infrastructure to do that effectively and efficiently. So that's one area where we've, we've now put a lot of investment um, and we really feel like there's a, a strong culture shift that's happening in the grass-fed beef producing community. Uh, I'm putting my hand on the power. Um, so that's one area and we've, in the past, we've done some work with meat processing. So we've had this kind of progressive um, work in, in strengthening the beef um, and meat um, supply chain, you could call it. We're also starting to get into some grain production, kind of thinking in a similar manner. What are the infrastructure needs to scale um, grain production in the state of Vermont? And we're finding, um, we're starting to make some progress with, with that. We've got King Arthur Flour that has some interest. There's a mill in Canada that's very interested in supplying more um, Vermont grown grains. Uh, but there are some infrastructure pieces that Vermont lacks in order to access those markets. So we've really put a lot of attention to that. And just another kind of area that we've been working in um, in terms of market development is actually independent grocery stores in the state of Vermont. Um, so we've been providing uh, through consultant direct store, in-store um, trainings, which might be sort of more business management, but it could also be how do you better merchandise local food in your store. A lot of these independent grocers, um, you're not effectively marketing, merchandising local, and they could be um, you know, really making that a part of their store's identity. And also they have trouble sometimes knowing you know, what Vermont products are available in certain um, product categories. So our consultant is helping them identify those things and, and figuring out how can they source them into the store. So we're trying to increase um, you know, access into retail markets through that program for our local producers. And, and in turn, hopefully putting some pressure um, on the larger kind of retailers to, to also be supplying more local as, as that program finds success. So those are two areas I think where we've take, taken a focused approach and, and we found that we can identify these problems and issues with some research and investigation and then we can 
with a little investment and some resources, we can actually start to solve some of those problems. Um, and so we're just scratching the surface. There's so much more to do. Um, and then problems, I just say on the other side of the coin here is that um, so we all kind of have heard that you know there's a lot of struggles in the dairy industry, and that's not insignificant. That has huge implications for land use patterns in the state of Vermont, our cult kind of our cultural heritage and identity. Um, and, and the thing is, it's, it's not easy for those businesses to make a shift. There's a lot of things in the marketplace and market development that need to happen, uh, whether they're, if they wanna go organic or they wanna um, diversify their operations or transition completely to a new form of production. So I think it's just, that's a huge challenge. And connected to that, the challenge of how do we access um, markets both you know I think we've done a great job here in Vermont but a lot of producers are saying we, we need to get outside of the state but we don't know how or we don't have the distribution um, to do that and and that's not an easy problem uh, to solve and there's also the paradox of sometimes those markets aren't paying um, prices that are really supportive of what our producers need so um, it's it's a tricky um, situation and um, it's going to require a lot of creative, innovative um, work. So that's kind of what we're trying to think about for the next, basically the next 10 years. Um, so, so what I think is working well um, from my perspective as a buyer at the co-op um, with our work with local vendors is I, I, I think um, some of the work I do around uh, pricing and promotions specifically for local vendors is uh, um, is a good system we have in place. It's 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 certainly things like um, you know one of the major things we do for local vendors is provide uh, discounted local margin, um, which essentially means we charge less based on cost for local products and make less profit on those items in order to help them be competitive with some of the national brands who because of the way they buy ingredients and the way they streamline production can have lower costs. So I think that's a, a really great system we have in place um, for our departments. Uh, and it really does sort of give local products a step up when otherwise they might struggle to compete. Um, and then one of the other um, systems I really enjoy working with um, is our uh, member sales. So for our departments, um, and probably you all know our member sales, <laughs> uh, for our departments, um, or for my department specifically, we do strictly local items for our member sales. So everything that appears in that flyer is a, a local item or a local brand. And we do 16 different local brands every month on sale. Um, Jason was mentioning Sobre Mesa is on sale right now. That's one of them. And that's a way that we can really highlight those brands. Um, so many of our sales are predetermined um, by NCG, and so this is a way for us to stand out both as a store, as a co-op in the state, um, and to push local product, which uh, is great and super important. Um, and it seems to go well. I would say um, the flip side to that is, is sort of our biggest challenge uh, as, a, as a buyer with local products is the time and resources it takes to do that work. Um, national brands have Brokers, they have people who sell their product for them, who plan their deals for them, who work with distributors for them. Um, local products don't have that same advantage. Uh, so that's certainly a struggle. And it's a lot of time investment on buyers' parts of the co-op. So that's, um, I would say that's, <laughs> that's our, our biggest challenge we're facing, or the biggest challenge I'm, I'm seeing for the co-op um, and our relationship with local items. Uh, so one of the things that's been working really well for us is uh, something that was a challenge when we started out, and that was uh, how well known uh, fermented foods were in general. Um, we were doing a lot of early uh, education and explaining uh, what fermented foods were and, and how they were made or why they were good for you or how to eat them, and now uh, I have customers sharing recipes with me and, and, and telling me exciting things and we're hearing more and more from people. Uh, my doctor recommended this or they, my doctor said I need to be eating more probiotic rich foods. Um, so that has turned into what uh, is now going well for us. We don't have to uh, work 
we don't have to work so as hard uh, at marketing as we used to because it's becoming much more um, not only accepted, but uh, people are being uh, more excited and excitable about fermented foods and uh, it's becoming, experiencing this resurgence in popularity, you know, because salting your, your food to preserve it has been around pretty much forever. Um, but, but only recently has it become more and more popular and we see new companies popping up a uh, handful every year. Um, so then that, that leads me into, well, what is our, our, our challenge as a business in its, its fifth year? Uh, is probably that it's just my wife and me and now we have a, a young uh, one-year-old. And uh, so our challenge is working to meet this demand that exists here in Boston and um, probably a large part of New England. Uh, so we're working towards uh, making that inventory that we need to meet those demands, uh, probably with uh, employees for the first time, and uh, also working with uh, distributors or, or hiring someone to distribute for us if that's driving things down to Brattleboro, for example. Um, we work with one organization called Farmers to You. They have like an 800 plus uh, member CSA based out of Boston. We sell them a whole bunch of cases every few weeks. Um, so as we grow, we're just bringing on people to help us make more and move more um, because the demand's there and, and we're, we're working to meet it. Thanks, guys. Um, I have a little housekeeping announcement, which is that there's lots of extra food. And it, please, if you leave early, the instruction from Scott was to take food with you. So there are plates there and you can be creative about how to bundle that food up and take it home. <laughs> Um, those were great answers and really resonated with a lot of what I think about now in kind of building this movement and this marketplace. In so many ways, I think for a lot of us, we look out at the landscape and feel like, wow, we've arrived, local food is here, it's doing really well, it's so vibrant, you can get it at the co-op, at Farmers to You, at Walmart, at Costco, um, which in you know is something that from the movement side, like we've really been pushing to get local food into all those outlets, and so a lot to celebrate there. And then at the same time, as that marketplace matures, we're seeing a lot of the kind of increasing complexity of the, the challenges that grow with that. Um, I think price pressure is one thing we really hear that suddenly, you know, Jasper Hill Cheese is at Costco and at Hunger Mountain, and of course the economics at Costco is really different and the price back to the producer is really different at Costco than it is at Hunger Mountain. The relationships are really different at Costco or Walmart than at Hunger Mountain or the farmer's market, that all these channels offer kind of different opportunities and different ways to value our experience and our food. And it's, it's getting harder and harder, it feels to me, to understand, like, are we winning or losing? I can't quite tell. It, it feels like a really challenging moment that in some ways it feels like we're stronger than ever, and in some ways it feels like this movement and our agricultural economy and culture is like more fragile than ever. And so I'm, I really hope you all will think about that a little bit um, and, and reflect in your own lives, you know, it, what, what you feel is valuable about local agriculture. And, and um, you know, we all have that experience. I have the experience of looking at at a similar product in two different stores and feeling like, oh, I clearly want the cheaper one because cheaper is um, better. That's like how my brain has been trained. But then remembering it, this, this whole work that I do in the food movement has really helped me think about what happens when something is cheaper and what we're externalizing with that or what values we're losing. And, so anyway, that's kind of a rant, but <laughs> what I was hoping to launch on point. On point. is um, just a question to you all about what, you know, as, as a state and as a community, um, what we should be, what, what kind of, we should be prioritizing to strengthen Vermont's local agricultural economy and culture and how we can strengthen our local food system. You know, if there's policies or, or statewide, movements or efforts that we should be contributing to, and then particularly how individuals like those of us in this room and organizations like Hunger Mountain can, can really speak to those priorities and those campaigns. Olivia, can I start with you? To... Start. So, so, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> 
Um, so I, I won't pretend to know that much about policies or state policies, because I, I don't, but um, I think one of the top priorities for our state right now in, in really supporting um, these smaller local vendors is resources. Um, I think so much of the burden falls on, on these small vendors. Um, as far as getting everything right every time, all the time, um, with packaging, with distribution, with um, the right temperature of their product when it gets delivered to a store. You know, they are expected to have this knowledge um, and to know it all the time. And it's, a, it's definitely a, a, a huge burden and a, a large amount of work that they have to do. Um, and so I, I really believe that one of the things the state can do is um, provide better resources in that way. Um, provide classes on basic marketing, how to get your name out there, how to use Facebook, how to use Instagram, you know, how to really um, market yourself in some basic ways. And, uh, and also, um, you know, how to package your product, what needs to be on your packaging, because we see a lot of the time product come in without correct weights or without correct uh, addresses or, or um, you know those sort of issues that pop up uh, and you know the state then comes through and audits us and lets us know when things are wrong so um, I think that's that's a place where maybe the state could be doing more positive work instead of more audits or, or sort of slapping on the wrist which is what I, I see happening now um, and and that's you know that's sort of a barrier for these businesses instead of a, instead of promoting them or instead of helping them um, and then the other piece of that, I think, is also just helping them understand the marketplace. Um, what's out there, what isn't there, what do we have too much of in Vermont? Um, what are we missing in the marketplace? What, what isn't a local producer making right now that a co-op or, or Shaw's or anyone could be really excited about bringing in? Um, so those trends and insights uh, that are so much more accessible to people who are connected or who have, you know, who have those, who have those um, that technology at their fingertips that a small local business might not have. Um, I think those are some of the things that, uh, that we could be doing. Um, and then do you know we're talking also about what the individual can do? Yeah, all of it, yeah, all of it, yeah. yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> so, um, so what I think the individual can do, uh, certainly, you know, basics, shop at Hunger Mountain Co-op. <laughs> um, but I think beyond that, it's when you shop there, really think about, you know, am I picking local or am I picking a national brand? And uh, can you pick local? Is, is that an option for you? And if it is, you know, seek it out and, and help, us, help us sell more local product. Um, that's a big thing that I think everyone can, can try to do or look at doing, you know, every time they shop. And, and whether you're at Hunger Mountain Co-op or at Shaw's or at Costco, um, picking local I think is always important. Uh, so if it comes down to Synergy Kombucha or Kiss Kombucha, maybe pick Kiss Kombucha that time. Um, and then, um, what can the co-op do? Uh, I, think, I think things like this panel is really meaningful. I think starting the discussion is, is a place that we can come from naturally. Um, initiating the discussion, bringing in people from outside of the co-op to help us understand better maybe what we're not doing, maybe what we could do better. Um, so I think that's a... a a piece that we're starting to do that we can do more of, that we can really focus on. Um, but I think also, you know, I talked a lot about the state providing resources for local vendors. I think the co-op can also be a major resource for local vendors. We have um, tools that are at our disposal that are major industry insights um, that we can say, you know, fermented foods is a huge growing category right now. And we know that. We can see it across the country in different stores, what's going well, what's not, um, what's missing, and uh, I think we can do that. We can also really help them become retail ready. So um, what's missing from their packaging? What's not gonna work on a shelf? <laughs> what's, you know, if their label isn't visible, um, you know, standing on a shelf, that's something that we, as a co-op, maybe have more insight into than, than someone who's just starting out or just packaging their product for the first time. Um, uh, so I'd like to say that uh, we've received a lot of support and help from the state in pursuing this, this business of ours, you know, value-added food producer. Um, things like UVM Extension uh, have helped us out a lot, whether it's uh, um, different types of professional um, 
guidance or uh, help with, uh, even we even had someone come out and teach us how to use Excel. Um, not Excel, uh, QuickBooks. Anyways, uh, the Vue VM extension in Vermont as a whole is extremely friendly and supportive of young food-related business uh, entrepreneurs. Um, that was one of the things that attracted us to this state years ago when we decided we wanted to start up our own food business. Um, and uh, I think the, uh, the state also uh, does a good job with uh, its, its crop cash, it's like food stamp program. We see that a lot at farmer's markets. Uh, I wish that those uh, were eligible for purchasing more than just strictly raw fruits and vegetables. For example, they cannot buy a jar of sauerkraut with their crop cash, or they can't buy a jar of jam, for example. Um, so that would be something that, that could be expanded. Um, if we're speaking ideals, I would like to see the state fund, uh, or at least partially fund, farmers markets. I think it's a huge part of uh, our identity as a state. Uh, I think a little bit of that would go a long way, even just the gesture of it alone, kind of bringing in together the, the state and local governments a little bit more in regards to farmers markets. Um, I think Hunger Mountain Co-op does a phenomenal job supporting uh, its vendors, and I can really mostly only speak of my personal experience and, and a handful of people I've, I've talked to about this, um, but just uh, what they're doing seems so great, being uh, very uh, eager and excited to have us uh, come on board, which was wonderful, but all the uh, open slots and encouragement of demoing and, uh, and really just making it work as easily as possible, whether that's uh, you know being flexible um, on pricing or flavors even, um, and things like that. So they, they seem to have a real genuine interest in our success as a business. And they're not just, if we don't meet a certain expectation, they're not like ready to move on to the next thing the way maybe a lot of grocery stores might. You know, if they can get something two cents cheaper, those other guys might do it and not really care about anything else. And there seems to be a lot of ethics involved with all the decision making that Hunger Mountain does. Um, and that leads me into a little bit about what the individual can do to help support our local food community. And I think one of the biggest ones is just having um, maybe a, a slight shift or, or a high value of what local food is, why it's important, and why it's different and maybe why it might cost a little more or not be available year-round, and understanding those different variables and how they uh, become a part of that end product uh, and, and, and all, the, all the different things that, that, that make it um, what it is and um, maybe being okay with, with not buying you know, certain types of food year-round and at least in our household, we really look forward to the first strawberry, the first tomato of the season, you know, especially when we're at the farmer's markets every single week and we get to see things come on. Um, that's how we value local food in a way in our home is we, we, you know, we only eat asparagus a few weeks out of the year and then we, you know, it's that much more special when it comes around again. Um, obviously that, that type doesn't work for, for every household, um, but it's just a, a nice model for us. We, we do try and eat local year round uh, and that means our diet changes seasonally quite a bit but we're also very passionate about food preservation. One of the things that brought us into uh, the fermented foods and we do a lot of freezing and drying and a tiny bit of canning um, and really uh, we have a lot of joy in our household preserving the food to sustain us through the, the winter months. Um, and then um, we try and buy direct from the producer or farmer as much as possible. Uh, to the extent that we, we like to be able to refer to the food on our, our table on a first name basis. You know, that's Beth's beef or John's carrots or Kyle's mushrooms. Uh, and if we can, you know, do that to everything on the plate, we have the first name, you know, we, that feels good to us and we really like that. And, um, I, I, could, I could probably talk, you know, in depth in, in a long time of what and how I value uh, local food uh, is, um, but we can, you can chat with me more here, and I think I've, I've covered uh, kind of the, the broadly enough. I don't feel like I have anything to add. That was... <laughs> um, but no, I, so I'll, yeah, sort of starting at the individual level, I think, 
Um, you know, the first thing is if you're buying local, keep buying local. It, it does make a difference. Um, you know, Gene was kind of saying, and I, I feel like this too sometimes. Of you know, are are we winning? Are we losing? What's what's happening? But the one thing that I do know is that every dollar counts, and and you know, do, doing what you're doing does make a difference. Um, I think yeah, along those lines is. Once a month, try something new. What's something local that you haven't tried, and, and you don't have to kind of you know extend yourself too far. Once a month, not not asking a lot, but just try it, and maybe that thing becomes a new staple for you. Um, likewise, I think what's what's one item that you could substitute that could be local that you're not currently buying. So what's that one item that you could be buying every time you're at the grocery store that you're currently not? Again, kind of starting, starting simple, starting small, you know, not trying to be heroic in terms of what you're purchasing is, um, but do something that feels manageable to you. I think, you know, again, what you're buying and what you could be buying in addition to that, every dollar does make a big difference. Um, and then I think, you know, there's to the extent that you can, and I think the co-op is probably a place that's receptive to this. Uh, is is how are you expressing your demand? If you're if you're thinking, is there a local this or that? Ask you know, ask someone at the co-op, ask someone at the store that you're shopping at, um, because that does make a difference. Buyers don't know what consumers want until they express some sort of explicit demand for it. So. Um, you know, I think sometimes that's that's another just vehicle of being very direct about what you want and perhaps what the co-op or other source could be providing. Um, you know, I think similarly, what could the co-op be doing? The co-op is doing a lot. I mean, the co-op is unique. It's different. It is values oriented, which is not the norm in retail. Uh, at all. So I, I say the co-op doubles down on that and, and continues to build out what it's created. And, and that, likewise, as members, is something that, you know, as a member of the co-op, I'm, I'm all in on that. Um, and I, I'm sure the membership would, would be as well, because, you know, if, if we can't win there, then we're, we're not going to win <laughs> nationally or regionally. So it's, it's really we have to um, you know, be supportive of that mission and, and hold, um, you know, decision makers and, and, and management and staff accountable to that mission um, as much as we can. Um, so I, oh no. So I really, yeah, so I really think that we should, there we go. All right. <laughs> this could be interesting. Um, so we should, yeah, we should, we should be supportive of, of really what the co-op stands for and, and, and double down, because um, it, it matters more than it ever has um, in, in a world where there's right now not a lot to be, it's hard to be hopeful about things, and I think the co-op is one of those things that we can be hopeful about. Um, you know, I think in, in terms of policy, I, I think the dynamic here is that Vermont does have a lot of um, strong programs in place that support uh, producers and, and provide services to them, but not necessarily, they're not always resourced um, at the levels that they could be or that they should be. Uh, you know, agriculture in being such a huge part of what the state is and, and how we identify with it is surprisingly a small part of, you know, the overall budget. Um, in, in state policy. So I think, you know, as, as, as citizens with representatives, anytime uh, something related to agriculture comes up or there's a program that you've heard about, ask them about it, ask them where they stand in terms of increasing funding. Um, you know, I think there's things like Working Lands Enterprise Initiative that provides grants to, to farm and food businesses to make infrastructure investments, to improve their business, to scale up, to grow, um, and be successful. You know, that's funded, that's been funded at, at good levels, but I, I think it could be funded more than it is, and that's something that, you know, having some awareness of that program exists, and maybe I can talk to my legislator about it, is it, it that makes a difference too, because we are a state where you can have a cup of coffee with your legislator. You know, they'll, they'll make the time to do that. Same thing with farm to school. Uh, there's, there's produce um, infrastructure support that, that is available to producers. But again, all these things are sort of 
you know, it's finding small pots of money for what is a huge demand uh, for those resources. There's the Farm and uh, Forest Viability Program, which provides uh, business assistance, which UVM Extension is a part of, sort of a partner in that. Those are the programs that make a huge difference, but they're, in my mind, under-resourced, and I think that's, that's one of the keys. Another thing that I want to throw out here um, is, from a policy perspective, and there's conversations happening about this, but we need to kind of change the paradigm around environmental stewardship. We need to move towards outcome and incentive-based uh, policies that rewards the farms that are doing the right things, that are going above and beyond and actually providing positive benefits to the public in terms of environmental stewardship. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the conversation around environmental stewardship right now is in a very negative light um, around water quality, but you know, if you really think about it, um, 10 acres of farmland uh, provides a lot of flood mitigation, um, it provides a lot of wildlife habitat, it provides scenic views that attract tourism to our state. And those are all positive public benefits that don't necessarily get compensated. So I think we need to kind of rethink um, the way we do um, regulatory policy around in, in our environmental stewardship. Um, and that in turn is, you know, those are, it's, it's really hard for producers to get paid um, a, a fair price for the, the food product that they're providing. And so that's another means of, of revenue for the stewardship that they're actually providing to us, um, to the public. Um, and so I, I just encourage people to, to pay attention to that and, and kind of pay attention to the tone of the conversation around um, water quality that exists right now and maybe, you know, how, how can we shift that to be um, perhaps a little more reflective of, of what farm, farms are providing to the landscape um, in, in terms of those benefits. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop on that. Thanks, guys. That was super thoughtful. Um, I think we can turn it over to you all now. And I love, um, Jake, what you said. It made me reflect on this report I read recently about shifting our languaging away from food consumers to food citizens and really recognizing that if we think of ourselves as citizens instead of consumers, we will feel much more empowered to engage with the whole complexity of this system and recognize that we have more opportunities to engage and build this than just our shopping decisions, although our shopping decisions are also important. Um, and so I'd love to, to send it out to you to hear about um, you know, how you all value local agriculture and local food, and if you see yourself as a food citizen, and, and what kinds of actions you are hoping to take or are taking. Um, are you thinking about the dairy crisis and how that might spill out over to the viability of our whole working landscape? And are there other questions or thoughts you'd like to share? Should I walk around with this? Is that helpful? Thank you all for being here. Um, I had, uh, I come from, maybe I'm bringing a slightly different perspective, but I think it's Jake. Yeah, like a couple questions. So one, you talked about bringing more grain in. Is that grain for animals or grain for people? And what is the split? Because right now, about I think around 80% of grain goes to feeding cattle rather than factory farms, rather than feeding people when we have hungry people. Yeah, uh, I was referring to um, grain for human consumption. So, and, and very much um, her sort of heritage varieties that have historically been grown in Vermont um, and, and providing sort of actual market opportunities for the, the sale of those grains to um, bakeries, mills, um, for whether it's flour production, bread, et cetera. And the other question now is about the food quality issue. I mean, sorry, the water quality issue. Um, so you were talking about the benefits of farms uh, when you talk about water quality, and what about all the runoff from factory farms that, you know, the manure that gets into our water and um, soils it, poisons it? Yeah, I think, so I don't want to, I don't want to diminish the need for a baseline of regulations that, that penalizes and discourages egregiously bad behavior and, and practices. I, you know, I don't think um, I can sit here and say that isn't happening. Um, 
but but I think it's it's gotten to a point where we've forgotten that there are farms that aren't doing those things and actually are doing a lot of really beneficial practices that don't get compensated and do provide lots of public benefit. So I so it's more of I, I'd like to just find a, a balance in that conversation to say, yes, we do need regulations that are are you know able to protect our waterways and and penalize those who are violating, you know, and 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 basically making the public pay for their their bad behavior. Um, so I, I think that's absolutely critical as a baseline. But I think also oftentimes what's missing in these conversations is that, you know, there's a lot of people who are doing really great things for us, and and they're doing it, you know, basically at a cost to themselves, and 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 the marketplace does not compensate them for the products that they're providing, um, and so you know it's it's sort of rethinking. I mean, it's really rethinking a lot of the structure of our economy in many ways, um, and. And the other thing too is that, well, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll stop there. Jake, that um, I think the the um, ecosystem services is such a exciting and kind of complicated idea. And I wonder if is there a resource you could point people to who are interested in learning more about it? My, my master's thesis, no. <laughs> um, well, so, th so there's, there's two reports right now. Um, there's a Future of Ag report that came out recently. That's, uh, if you go to vermontfarmtoplate.com, you can find this. And then there's also uh, a group, Dairy Water Quality Collaborative, who've also put out a report that, um, that's outlined sort of the basic framework of how this would work. But um, if you search payment for ecosystem services, you can find a number of resources on this. And the other thing I would say, too, is that um, I see this too as uh, you know in, in in an era of a changing climate, where we are going to see more flood events, um, where uh, biodiversity loss is a is a huge issue. Um, you know, this is also a climate and a climate resilience strategy is is to really invest in our farmland as you know in some ways as natural infrastructure um, for. An age of climate change. Um, you know, there's there's some study, interesting studies that were done around the Middlebury area, where you know the natural landscape actually mitigated real flood damage um, in, in in Middlebury, and and I think, you know, the the farm landscape is is very much a, an important piece of um, yeah natural infrastructure to mitigate a lot of what could be real harm. Um, that we experience, you know, not every hundred years, but every ten years. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. This has been it's very interesting. Um, I have a question. Um, it might be for Olivia. Um, uh, regarding the, the dilemma of pumpkin seeds not being available, um, either at the co-op or practically anywhere I travel. Um, and the pumpkin seeds that are, are available at the co-op are from China, which I will not eat. Um, and I am wondering, considering the proliferation of pumpkins in this state and everywhere else, um, why we can't get local pumpkin seeds. Uh, I did purchase wonderful pumpkin seeds a month ago in Portland, Oregon, at a particular co-op. They do not have pumpkin seeds at other stores in Portland either. Um, and I was told by somebody that their Portland is one of the uh, states that grows a lot of pumpkins as well, and has pumpkin seeds, but they're, why aren't they available? Um, Sorry, I'm very Yeah, I'm very passionate about pumpkin seeds. <laughs> <laughs> well, while I'm walking the mic over, I could just. Actually, I am also. I was going to mention that pumpkin seeds for Okay, well, we'll let Olivia answer. <laughs> okay, 
Okay, the, hold your China question. Um, I will just say that the pumpkin seeds that we buy, the pepitas are, that are green, are not the same variety that come inside like your average pumpkin. So you have to grow a special kind of pumpkin. And I do know about a source in New York that I could tell you about. Great. <laughs> so um, I, I, uh, I will start off not passing the buck too much, but um, unfortunately, I don't actually buy for our bulk department. So I, I can't. Uh, I can't specifically answer the the logistics behind our bulk buyer's choice of pumpkin seeds, unfortunately, or where they're at right now. Um, I will say, uh, in, in maybe a little bit more general terms, um, that we can hopefully apply to pumpkin seeds. Um, I mean, this is the, this is information that's really helpful for us to know that we can then pass along to some of our growers or our buyers or our producers that we work with to say. Um, you know, if, if consumers come to us and say, or our members come to us and say, um, you know, I would love to see a local pumpkin seed, and I would pay more for a local pumpkin seed, um, then our bulk buyer is gonna is gonna be excited to do that and is gonna look for that. That doesn't mean necessarily that there is someone in the state of Vermont currently toasting pumpkin seeds or selling raw pumpkin seeds, um, but it's something that we can know and pass along to the producers who are maybe doing. Um, you know, our beans or our corn or something else, there's another opportunity, another, another option for them, something else that they can grow that we would be on board to buy. Um, so that's, that's a more general question as far as, or a more general answer. Um, I would say as far as some of the out of socks we see at the co-op, um, I mean, I think this, this goes back to some of the climate change stuff we were talking about. I think this is going to be a really, um, I think we're just seeing the beginning of some really dramatic uh, product losses in this country, especially locally produced, or not locally, but um, US made products. I think, uh, you know, we, we just found out that um, pretty much the entire crop of, of organic peas that were grown in this country for canning, for uh, three of the top uh, organic canned brands are not available. So we will not see organic canned peas this year. Um, and and these are these are things that we're finding, you know, more and more. There's there's a significant struggle for organic oats. There's a really significant struggle for organic grains. Um, both, you know, the demand has grown, so so there's just not enough. But also, um, there you know there are more crop failures. There are more reasons for crop failure. Um, the part of our the parts of our country that are producing these crops, especially these organic crops, are really suffering from weather-related issues. Um, so that's, I think, unfortunately, going to be the new normal. But I also think um, it positions us to to buy local, really more, you know, to, to rely on local farms and not rely on California or Wisconsin or some of these other um, production states that we've so heavily relied on in the past and, and that most stores rely on, um, because I think they're going to become less and less reliable. Yeah, that kind of makes me think about what Jason was saying about eating seasonally and knowing your farmers. I know um, I felt very similarly that it provides me with a lot of safety and security to feel like I know a number of different people I can get my food directly from. And after um, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, I read a study that said that the, uh, the small landholders were back up and producing food so much more quickly than the commodity agriculture, which kind of makes intuitive sense when you have a diverse garden with different kinds of trees and shrubs and small plants. Um, it's kind of easier to ba bounce back than a big field that is planted in a monoculture. So a lot of, I find a lot of hope and security in thinking about the resiliency we gain from a diversified agricultural landscape. Are, are there, I think we have time for probably two other quick questions. I don't know who was first. Yeah. Okay, we'll do all three of you. I'll come to you first. I don't need the microphone. Okay. Uh, Jake, you mentioned before, I think, that uh, farmers should be compensated for their efforts. Uh, exactly what would the source of compensation be? Where would it come from? How would you do it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, could, we could talk a long time about that. Um, I mean, there's there's different ways of approaching that. Um, so the way it's it's worked up in, in areas where this is happening, um, generally a municipality or uh, 
state government will act as um, basically the the payee um, or the payer um, uh, through tax collections. Um, there are some examples, though, however, of say uh, downstream water users who pay, you know, individually pay upstream farms um, for kind of on a per unit basis. Um, so you can do it in a very kind of private market system, or you can do it in a kind of publicly regulated uh, payment scheme um, with, you know, there's some form of verification that happens that you're verifying you're getting paid for the delivery of some verifiable service, ecosystem service is what it would be called. Um, and there's continue to be a lot of work as to what system is most efficient and effective. There's a lot of transaction costs that can occur um, in a private market system that that central kind of a centralized government public system can can be more effective in um, addressing. But yeah, there's different ways to kind of look at it and, and structure it. Are there some examples of this, like the, the federal, are there some USDA programs like WIP? Um, yeah, but there's also an example very close to us in the Hudson River Valley. So New York City, uh, a number of year, years ago, had the option of paying billions of dollars to, um, to create a, uh, you know, in, within the city limits, um, uh, wastewater treatment facility. Um, or they decided that they would pay farms in the Hudson River Valley to implement a certain set of practices and deliver the levels of water quality that they were seeking through the wastewater treatment facility. And so they've invested in those farms to do those things rather than make the investment in a not only an upfront billion dollar investment in the wastewater facility, but uh, are accruing yearly millions of dollars operational fees that would come with that. Uh, so there's also kind of ways in which you can look at it as sort of the opportunity cost of doing one thing or another, and it becomes much cheaper um, to pay landowners to do certain things rather than do it through built infrastructure. Um, so that, yeah, that's one example that's close to home. Thank you. Um, I recently read somewhere, I don't remember the exact number, but it was some really high number of gallons of water, like maybe a thousand gallons of water it takes for every pound of beef. And I've also read about how much grain and other resources going into the production of beef. And several, what I would ordinarily consider to be good environmental organizations seem to be steering people towards vegetarian diets and away from meat because meat is so supposedly so resource intensive. Yet, it seems to me that if you put some fence around some kind of poor land that's not very good crop land and let some animals graze it here on the hillside of Vermont and, then, and they have access to a stream so they can drink for the summer, for a couple summers, and then slaughter them in the fall, that's a really good way to accrue some protein to the to the uh, animal's body, doesn't require any grain, it's good healthy food, and I fail to see that that's as bad for the environment as some of these organizations um, like to make us think. So, um, in the vein of rooting for local products, I was wondering if you can shed some light on that. Is, does, does anybody have any numbers or any facts about how, how much resource it takes to grow animals in the pasture versus in the feedlots, and you know what's the environmental impact and, and some of that. And can you answer that uh, this afternoon? <laughs> Thank you. I would just say I, I don't have you know sort of s the studies and hard numbers, but this was one reason I mentioned uh, pasture raised meats is one of my favorite things. So I'm glad you then asked that question because. You know, yes, there have been a lot of reports that have come out around um, you know climate friendly diets, and oftentimes meat gets sort of looked at as um, you know something to cut back on and um, eat less of. And and while 
generally, I, I absolutely agree with that. The analysis is usually based on, say, growing beef in a feedlot in Arizona that needs to irrigate or you know the crops that they're growing require irrigation and intensive energy inputs um, that are coming externally uh, in order to, to grow that protein. I, I think the Northeast is, is different in that way. It's ecologically appropriate to be growing pasture-raised animals. It's, it's good in an integrated system as they're providing additional inputs that are important for um, you know, vegetable production. Um, so that, that's why I feel really good about eat, knowing you know, that I'm eating a, a, a chicken or a, a beef uh, or a meat you know, raised here in the Northeast rather than I stay away from anything else. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I, and I think there, there, is, there is, I think there are studies to back that up. Um, and I, I just think there are good ecological reasons why livestock is actually good for our environment here in the Northeast, whereas it may be less appropriate um, in, in other places. Um, so that's sort of how I think about it. So um, I'm really interested in how we protect our pollinators. I know there's lots of research out there, a lot of people doing this work all over the world. And um, I know we have a lot of successful bee raisers in this state too. So I'm just wondering, um, what are we doing? How are we sharing information and making sure we don't have to take paintbrushes out and pollinate everything? I don't know if anyone wants to tackle that. <laughs> Who's answering? <laughs> I, can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I would say one of the easiest things I think we could do as a community is uh, build these uh, the pollinator houses, which are essentially uh, just pieces of uh, like Japanese knotweed or any kind of semi-hollow uh, branches, you know, tucked into a birdhouse type thing. If our, if our schools and churches were making these as like their craft projects and they wound up in people's backyards, think about how many thousands if not hundreds of thousands of pollinators that would support. So just one small, relatively simple idea. Um, I, uh, we, we have bees at, at our farm. We haven't been successful in overwintering them. Uh, well, we, we just got them last year. Um, Anyways, I sort of feel as, a, as someone who runs a homestead almost obligated because of the crisis that the bees are experiencing. So I would encourage people who have the means and the abilities to have bees, even if they don't harvest the honey, just for the sake of the bees. Okay, one of our council people has asked for one last question. And as we go there, I'll just say that I, I'm sorry I didn't totally hear your question because I was talking to her, but one of the most important things we can do to support pollinators is to not use neonicotinoid pesticides on our gardens. And this is a great place where you can make a choice as a consumer to not use those chemicals at all because they are so toxic, um, but also to really talk to our state legislators and tell them that we think they should be banned from our state and not allowed in any of our horticultural stores or our um, hardware stores. So the, the word is neonicotinoid. It's kind of complicated. You can say neonix and people will know what you're talking about, but they are really, really, really killing our pollinators and it's time for them to be gone from our state. Thank you. Um, so my question is about um, food insecurity. So I understand um, because I was listening to NPR on Sunday afternoon, there was a program of about um, a woman that interviewed a bunch of different farmers um, who were food insecure. Uh, either they didn't have the money or they didn't have the time or both to actually get the food that they needed to keep on running their farms. Um, so that's on the one side and then of course on the other side there's the rest of us that aren't farmers that may be food insecure. And um, what can we do as a community to uh, help farmers be more food secure and 
the community uh, at large be more food secure. answers to this, but um, I, I will say, you know, I think as far as supporting our farmers who are food insecure, you know, what we've been talking about all night, buying local, buying buying their food, buying their produce, supporting them, getting them into stores, recommending them to your, your store that you shop at the most, um, you know, so much of the work that co-op does is based around what our members want, and so if we see that something's selling, we're going to buy more of it, we're going to expand the line, we're going to help those farmers in that way, and, and so that's really a... Um, I think that's, you know, that's how we can support farmers. Um, so that's that's one stream is the consumers supporting the farmers, but there's been more conversation about other other ways of, like, uh, the city of New York paying the farmers to do uh, different kinds of work that effectively um, do the same thing as wastewater treatment plants. So like, they're supporting the farmers. And, you know, the municipality is supporting the farmers. So how can how can we do that sort of thing that feeds the farmers? Any any ideas about that? Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean it's it's yeah, I, I think it's one of those questions that brings in a lot of deep structural issues with our um, you know our economy. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, so I think some of the things that I've been sort of throwing out there tonight about payment for ecosystem services is so how do we create, you know, additional revenue streams um, for farms and the services that they're providing that might not be in the, the food itself. Um, also, you know, I, I, I think about this a lot because so many farms, you know, donate food to, to the local food shelf or the food bank. And they are, in turn, then food insecure. Um, and, and so I think a lot of the times, you know, there's this expectation that when they have that surplus, that their duty is to give it away. Um, and we don't really have a solid means for compensating that contribution. They can, you know, do some write-offs, and uh, but oftentimes they don't have tax liabilities that really amounts to anything. So. I, that, that's one area I think there's some states that have done some interesting things where it's, um, you know, they do have programs in place uh, to provide some compensation for those food donations. Um, and I think that's, that's something that, um, whether it's state or federal, that is an area that I think could be, there, that more work could be done and more advocacy, um, because I do think it's, it's somewhat absurd. Um, and. Um, unfortunate, um, you know, when they can't get really paid for the product that they're producing anyway, a, a good price for what they're producing to begin with. Um, yeah, and then on the other side of the equation is I, that's where I think we're talking about the larger economic inequalities <laughs> and uh, whether it's things like livable wage um, and just general, um, you know, Income distribution um, in, in in our country. There's there's something not right, um, you know, when so many people are in fact food insecure in a developed country like ours. So, um, you know, that's where yeah, as the citizen, not as the consumer, it's sort of keep pushing for the th the policies that would make a difference um, at a structural place rather than at sort of the. You know, more of the band aid um, to, to those problems. Thanks, Jake. Um, I feel like that's a great place to end on uh, really engaging our citizenship. And I know at the, at the movement level, we've been talking a lot about the agricultural crisis and specifically the dairy crisis that we're facing in the state right now, and that our, a lot of our dairy farmers are really looking at very, very hard times. And so this is a great time to not only stand up as a citizen, but also as a neighbor and a community member. Um, just the dairy farms in your community are probably having a really hard go of it right now. And it's a great time to lean in and reach out. It's um, for any of you who haven't farmed before, it can be really isolating. 
and um, it just it might be a nice time to go knock on your neighbors' doors and just check in with them and, and let them know that you you see them and, and you appreciate their work and if there's anything that we can do as neighbors and community members to, to support them right now, it's a great time to, to do that. So um, thanks, panel. You were great. Can we get a little round of applause for them? Time. So, people, if you would like to talk to your council, Scott's back. Just for one second, I was remiss before, and um, and I, I would just want to thank the three individuals um, in addition to Kari, but Rob, who did a fabulous job with uh, coordinating this and bringing it all together. Um, Stephanie, who's been doing double duty here and uh, babysitting and just pulling it all together, and, and Robin in the back for helping us out. So, thank, thank you for coming us that. Thank you. And once again, as Gene said, there's food if you want to kind of double uh, double bag or plate or whatever, please, there's tons of food here. And I'll turn it back over to Gene. We have a, um, a slide of just kind of the things that the council is working on, and we're, Gene will kind of facilitate this. These are a the few of the things that are on the priority list um, that the council is working on in this, uh, in this current term. And we're happy to answer any questions. Kari, your general, our general manager is here, and any of us council members, if we can uh, weigh in and uh, answer any of your questions, or if you certainly have any comments about the co-op, about the food, or the facility, or anything like that, please uh, please ask away. That's what we're here for. But, and thank you all for coming. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you all and, uh, and have you participate. And yes, thank you very much, panel. It was, it was fascinating. It was really, really good. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Okay, so it seems the council is dispersed around the room, and um, I guess the way this is going to work is I'll run around with the mic if you raise your hand, and we'll just start. Um, you all seem like very well-behaved people, but I'll just say that there are a number of us here. We have to leave here in 30 minutes, so we have to share the floor time. So just as some ground rules, maybe let's try like speaking once before you speak twice so that everybody has a chance to speak and trying to limit your um, talking to as few words as possible so there's plenty of space for others. And um, let's try not to interrupt anyone because we're here to listen and learn. So say your piece and then we'll listen. And I will run around rapidly with this mic. So does anybody, how many people know they want to speak right now? Raise your hand. Okay, <laughs> got the floor. So council, are you ready? You at attention? Okay, here we go, Matt. I just wanted to mention, um, I joined the co-op largely to try to avoid plastic, and um, it's not on that list. So that's a major priority for me in interacting with the co-op. Um, local food, obviously, super important too, but that's all. Hi everybody, Kari Bradley, General Manager, and uh, that's probably the most frequent comment or request that I've heard this past 12 months that is, seems to be on everybody's mind. It was about plastic. It was basically the intention to reduce our reliance on plastic, single-use plastic especially. So, as you well know, the co-op doesn't have the carry-out plastic shopping bag, and that's something that's sort of at the forefront, not just in, in our part of the world, but but nationwide, um, co-ops are, are getting this kind of request. There's a lot more awareness about plastic use. And in, in our business, the, the carry-out shopping bag is the most visible impact. So um, we don't have that problem, but we, we have a lot of other um, uses for plastic and single-use plastic. And all I can say is that we're working on it. We, we have a green team. We've charged them um, with you know coming up with a multi-year plan to reduce our reliance on plastics, and it's going to be a community effort, right? Because there's a lot of places where our business and other businesses, our vendors, are relying on plastics. So there's a lot of work to do, but I think there's a real commitment there. So. I have a question that's not so much related to the co-op, but I got here late. Uh, so I eat lunches here at the senior center which they serve on Tuesdays and Fridays. And um, fortunately, they publicize the menu in advance, so you can choose, pick and choose what you want to eat or what you want to come for. 
but they do serve beef a lot, and I prefer not to eat beef. Um, so I just wonder, and I have no idea what the source is, um, how we can like, I don't know, encourage them to serve it less, or <laughs> what would be the appropriate thing to do? Because I'm assuming it's not local. <laughs> Council, you got uh, wisdom on that? Speak to your authorities. <laughs> I mean, we're you know we're we're happy to use their space. This is the senior center, right? Yeah, we're um, speak to Jana, speak to the chef, I guess. I mean, we're not we don't have any influence other than um, I happen to be a member of the senior center, but um, you know we're we're not really affiliated with them. Um, but yeah, I was. I'm not shy about my opinions, and I would certainly bring them to uh, to those of the, to those at the top. Great. Other questions or comments? This is your chance to tell the council what you think about the co-op. All right, you got a thumbs up, everyone. A round of applause for Jesus. You did a fabulous job, and thank you so much. You're wonderful. Hey, I just have one quick question. Um, Hunger Mountain is such, we're, we're so um, uh, local centric. Is that something that's that's on the forefront of your mind and or your co-op in Plainfield? Is that something that you're, you wanna just maybe give a couple of comments about your experience with your members in, in that respect? Okay. Well, talking about the Plainfield co-op is always exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone here been to the Plainfield Co-op ever? Yes. All right. Um, it's great. It's really, well, it is the mother of Hunger Mountain Co-op yeah. and is now um, much, much smaller. <laughs> uh, we're, we're really an old-timey kind of co-op. Um, Plainfield is a great small town. And um, it's really a, a wonderful exercise in community development and community economics. To, to be a village of 1,200 people and have a million dollar store that stocks a ton of local products from you know, over 100 local vendors is, is really cool and really complicated. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I really encourage you all to come and just see the, see the Plainfield Co-op and of course we have board meetings and a community center and we'd love to welcome any of our sisters, brothers and sisters from Hunger Mountain anytime to come over. We'll, we'll gladly give you a tour of our expansive space. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's really, a, uh, it's such a great honor to work with all of you and really strengthening to have such a robust co-op network in, in Vermont. And um, just in terms of the broader marketplace, you know, again, I, I do this work, I study food systems, and it is so different. We are so lucky in Vermont to have a network of independent community-owned co-ops. Watching Amazon buy Whole Foods outside of our state has really changed the marketplace for local producers and, and natural foods. Um, really kind of decimated the marketplace. And so it's, we're all keeping an eye on that because it feels like it's kind of creeping in around us. Um, there are a lot of supply chain pressures which come from that um, merger that we're not totally immune to, but, um, but it's, a, it's a really great time to stand up and support your local farmers and also your local independent stores. So glad to, glad to have teammates like you guys. Yeah. Thank you. All right.